Good evening. I'm Harold Holzer, and I serve as director of Roosevelt House on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb. It's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, um, one of many uh, Zoom programs that Roosevelt House has hosted since uh, the lockdown began almost a year ago. Still, it's not usual that we do a sequel, a kind of return engagement on one of our programs, but we can say that this evening's program uh, and, its, and its hosts are back uh, by popular demand and with a roster of very, very special guests. Let me explain. Last summer, we presented a conversation with historian Jill Watts about her extraordinary book, The Black Cabinet, the untold story of African-Americans and politics during the age of Franklin Roosevelt. It was a great discussion and the audience could not get enough of it. Well, after the event, Jill and her conversation partner for that uh, evening, Hunter Professor Kelvin Black, got back in touch to suggest that we consider a follow-up, one that would bring together the descendants of some of the distinguished members of FDR's African-American advisory group unofficially known as the Black Cabinet. And we are thrilled to have them with us tonight to reminisce and reflect on these extraordinary groundbreaking figures. In many cases, as Jill's book told us, they had to experience and endure unspeakable indignities and outright discrimination merely to serve the nation during the New Deal. And I'm talking about being banned from uh, cafeterias in the departments in which they worked, among other things. Um, and their effort, of course, was focused on making sure that the New Deal extended as a New Deal to all Americans, Black as well as white. What better time to hear the stories that they heard, these, these guests tonight heard from their families uh, as we mark Black History Month at Hunter College and throughout the country. Jill, I know I speak for the entire Roosevelt House team when I say thank you for your leadership, both as a historian on this neglected subject and now as a, an unofficial member of the Roosevelt House Public Programming Planning Organization. It's been great to partner with you on both of these programs. And we're pleased that the timing has worked out so that uh, we reach our public today, our audience, just as you published the paperback edition of the Black Cabinet. So for those of you out there who don't have a copy of the book, look for a link in the chat section of the screen this afternoon to purchase one from our bookstore, Shakespeare and Company, together with an autographed book plate signed by Jill Watts. And Kelvin, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to Roosevelt House. Your knowledge and uh, uh, experience in these subjects have been a great help in conceiving this, this presentation. And as I mentioned last time, and I'll repeat it, we look forward to hosting you, hopefully in person, uh, for a discussion of your own forthcoming book, The Atlantic Dilemma. Tonight, we're privileged, as I said, to welcome some of the heirs to the Black Cabinet legacy, all of whom have in one way or another carried on that legacy by making a difference and serving the greater good. First, we're proud to welcome the son of Edgar G. Brown of Roosevelt's Civilian Conservation Corps. He is Judge Frederick Brown, the first African-American appellate judge in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He served in that post for nearly three decades. And when he reached the mandatory retirement age, he continued to serve on the bench as a recall justice until just a few years ago. His extraordinary career includes a decade of service in the US Army, a law degree from Harvard, and work at the highest levels of the American legal system, one time chief law clerk to the justices of the Supreme Court and a regional counsel for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So thank you for joining us, Judge Brown. We also welcome Dr. Sue Houchins, an author and associate professor in the Africana program at Bates College, where she teaches in gender and religious studies. It was reported that in her office at school hangs a framed photograph taken 83 years ago by the famed 
a visual chronicler of black Washington, Addison Skurlock, um, depicting all 20 of the leaders who comprise the black cabinet, including Dr. Houchins' father, economist Joseph Houchins of the Department of Commerce and the Census Bureau. Um, growing up, she knew of this picture rolled up in her father's dresser drawer. We look forward to seeing it later tonight and to hearing about it. Welcome as well to Donna Marshall, granddaughter of Constance Daniel from the Roosevelt era Department of Agriculture. Ms. Marshall really picked up where her grandmother left off, caring for the well being of Black communities. For three decades, she was an administrator and business manager in the healthcare system of Washington, D.C. A special thanks to her also for bringing a section of her grandmother's unpublished memoirs describing the Black cabinet, which we will share a portion of later. I understand it's one of the sources she's using for a forthcoming biography of her grandfather. Our next guest is Wanda Hunt McLean. And we can say that her connection to the history of her family and our, of our hometown are apparent in her work as a historian. She's the great granddaughter of one of the first black cabinet members, Henry Hunt of the Farm Credit Bureau. Ms. McLean's own research has deepened the record of black history in her state. As the founder and president of the Northeast North Carolina Underground Railroad Foundation, she has brought new attention to the escape routes of enslaved African Americans. Six new sites that have been added thanks to her to the National Park Service's National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. She uh, and her organization have also advocated for the preservation of one of the so-called Rosenwald schools, first built by Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. This one located on the campus of Elizabeth City State University, where Wanda worked for many years. So it's a genuine thrill to have all of you. Um, as a historian, I always wish that I could have talked to my subjects who lived in the Civil War, making it difficult, or their children and grandchildren, which I never got to do. So I can't wait to hear your recollections. And of course, at Roosevelt House, we have a living, uh, we believe, connection to the Black Cabinet because um, of the longstanding friendship between Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune, the first lady of the state and later the nation and the world and the first lady of the Black Cabinet, who became fast friends after uh, Dr. Bethune visited Sarah Delano Roosevelt at Roosevelt House. I hope you're seeing a picture of that meeting as we speak. Um, here under our roof, a 25 year long friendship began and we're proud that it happened in our very own Roosevelt House. So here's how the evening will proceed. After tonight's discussion led by Jill and Kelvin, we'll take questions as always from you, the audience, They'll be moderated by our programming curator, Mac Barrett. So do begin filing your questions whenever you're ready in the Q&A function of your computer. Um, our moderators, as I said, are Jill Watts, professor of history at California State University, San Marcos, uh, an expert in social history, cultural history, African-American history, and film history. Her interests range from the Black Cabinet to uh, Hollywood icons like Hattie McDaniel and Mae West, uh, and she's doing uh, a book we understand about Father Divine and his impact on culture in the Roosevelt era. Kelvin Black is Associate Professor of Transatlantic Studies in Hunter's English Department. He received his PhD from Berkeley with research focusing on 19th century transatlantic political discourse. Let me just end with a quote from Audre Lorde, Hunter alumna, teacher, civil rights and women's rights, LGBTQ rights activist, uh, because we're marking not only the 87th anniversary of her birth, but also uh, dedicating this entire semester at Hunter College to Audre Lorde. She's a subject of a community read uh, from her book, Sister Outsider. And Sister Outsider has a line in it that might as well have been written about the Black Cabinet who broke 
so many barriers and endured so much pain to represent African Americans in the Roosevelt era. So here's the quote. Sometimes we are blessed with being able to choose the time and the arena and the manner of our revolution. But more usually, we must do battle where we are standing. So here's to the members of the Black Cabinet who did battle where they were standing. Thank you all. And now over to Jill and Kelvin. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Harold, for that uh, very generous introduction. And thank you for, to the Roosevelt House for having us back uh, for this uh, fantastic conversation. I'm so excited uh, to speak with the descendants of our Black cabinet members that you, Jill, uh, introduced us to uh, in your fine book. Uh, we just wanted to spend uh, a few uh, moments uh, uh, framing our discussion for today before we um, enter into our individual uh, discussions and then our larger group discussion. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I recall that came out of our first time discussing uh, your book, Jill, uh, out of the Q&A, someone asked, uh, what would a black cabinet look like today? Um, and it was an interesting question um, that uh, we could answer in a variety of ways and I'm sure our panelists could answer in a variety of ways. Uh, but uh, uh, it gets at a kind, of, uh, uh, a kind of larger question that I think that you're unpacking in the book and also why it's so important that we speak to our panelists today. And that's uh, the issue of the kind of history that you have uh, produced for us. Most times when you get an institutional history by a historian, uh, there's a lot of focus uh, placed on presidents, um, on uh, uh, singular figures, not so much as a, uh, on a concert, uh, a constellation of individuals. And uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit uh, about what it means uh, for the Black Cabinet, uh, uh, the book that you wrote, uh, to be an institutional history that seeks to uh, uplift the uh, uh, team effort, uh, sometimes uh, conflictual uh, effort uh, to do policy. Thank you, Kelvin. It's, it's so good to be back at the Roosevelt House with you, even if it's virtual, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I couldn't ask for a better uh, partner to do this discussion. And um, before I, I answer that, because I have some ideas about that, um, let me say thank you to um, Matt Barrett for, um, for all the programming that he does at Roosevelt House, but for setting this up, um, Magna Mazurik. Um, um, thank you, Daniel Culkin. <laughs> thank you, Roosevelt House. And thank you, Harold Hauser, for having me back. And thanks to all the panelists. I'll keep saying thank you all throughout the evening. <laughs> so um, it's interesting because when you talk about institutional histories, it, we always, when we look at these kinds of eras, we're looking at, like you said, presidential biographies, and it can't help escape me that today is George Washington's birthday, right? <laughs> but it's so much bigger, right? It's 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 so much bigger. All the all these figures who um, head the nation, they're so much bigger than just a single individual. And in institutional histories, when we look at it, we look at this kind of rational thinker model where. They, they behave in rational ways and generate rational policies through systematic processes, right? And um, what that doesn't calculate in is the importance of individuals who help shape policy and help drive a lot of what occurs. At each of these folks come in with compet competing agendas and competing backgrounds and ideas. So that's so important when you think about a formation of a quote unquote administration, right? And that's why the Black Cabinet is important. That story hasn't gone, it, it didn't get the attention that it should have gotten at its time or throughout history. So, so they very much play a role, not only in shaping that administration, but in shaping the New Deal, which is very much policies that affect us today. And we're hearing we're gonna have a new, 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 I can't even say it, a new, new deal. So- That's the, right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, that's great. You know, another question that I recall, um, actually, um, 
uh, I must recall it fuzzily because I, I mostly remember how we answered <laughs> answered it. Uh, but it, it was uh, uh, a question essentially about the enduring legacy um, and significance of the work of uh, our uh, uh, the uh, the relatives of our panelists um, and and the others that served in the black cabinet. And you'll recall that uh, uh, personally, I'm uh, uh, deeply invested and interested in the two blue books uh, that the black cabinet uh, 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 folks put together. Um, there are two uh, that they put together that are chock full of uh, uh, excellent public policy prescriptions that got shelved. And I'm sure uh, some of our panelists will speak to that. But you know, I said something to the effect that um, uh, when uh, uh, sometimes we need to create um, uh, um, you know, a new instrument, we do it. But if we don't need to reinvent the wheel, let's not do that. And um, uh, I would love for you uh, to give us a sense of uh, the types of problem solving or an example of the ways in which the Black Cabinet problem solved um, in this way that you're describing that's, that is indicative of the institutional history that you're getting at, where it's a bunch of people coming together to solve problems in surprising and unpredictable and idiosyncratic ways. Right, I think that's, I, I like the way you put that because it's unpredictable. We don't know, it, it, when we talk about institutional histories, you can't factor in all the variables, right? So I'll, I'll go fast because, because we don't have a lot of time <laughs> and we, we Kelvin, I have to hold us to time too, right? Right, right, right. Because <laughs> we want to get to the descendants. But um, a, a great example of this, if you think about it, occurs really early on in the Black Cabinet's history in 1934, just after, um, well, it's about a year into the New Deal. And there's a meeting which um, a number of the Black Cabinet members attend. And it's across the agencies in, in the New Deal and in the Cabinet departments. And they've come together at the urging of black leaders and members of the black cabinet to begin to discuss, to begin, note I say begin, a year into the administration to discuss the situation for African-Americans. And in this meeting, there's a really interesting moment where um, the Tennessee Valley Authority is confronted because it isn't giving adequate assistance to African-Americans in an area in which many, many areas around the Tennessee Value projects are predominantly black. And so this occurs and when, they're, when the Tennessee Valley Authority representatives who are white come to the meeting, when they're confronted, they say, well, um, we did uh, this using quantitative methods. We looked at the, the area, we looked at the district and we hired in proportion to who, who lived in the district and it was predominantly white. And so we invoked a quota, quote unquote, right? So Robert Weaver, who's a key figure in the black cabinet and he's probably a very familiar name to the viewers because he later on becomes the first African-American member of a White House cabinet under Lyndon Johnson and his good childhood friend, Bill Hasty, they go off and they talk about this and they've been talking about how to fight discrimination in New Deal programs because New Deal programs are bypassing black people and they are suffering the Great Depression at a greater proportion than, than, than most populations throughout the United States. And so they come back to the next meeting and say, we like this idea of doing it quantitatively. Let's really look at the districts surrounding Tennessee Valley projects. And indeed, when we look at it, and if we want to go proportionally, we will see that Black people are the largest members of those communities, and they should have the majority of the jobs, not just an insignificant number. And, and you, you look at that, that's so, that's so significant because in the time that it occurs, insisting that agencies do not discriminate, even if you write a clause into a contract isn't enough. It answers the riddle on how can we enforce it and how can we prove discrimination. And that lays the groundwork for later on legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and what we call affirmative action. And indeed, um, William Trent, who's an important black cabinet member himself even evokes the term just a few years later saying we need to act affirmatively in order to combat discrimination. So 
So hopefully that wasn't too long-winded <laughs> of an example. So I'm excited to get to the descendants. Likewise, thank you for that. Thank you that, for that, Jill. Thank you for the question. <laughs> okay, so uh, our first descendant uh, that we have the pleasure and honor to speak with today is Professor uh, Sue Houchins. And she is uh, the daughter of Dr. Joseph Roosevelt Houchins. Uh, uh, Jill and I both have uh, questions um, um, uh, for you, uh, of course, as we have signaled. Uh, one of them uh, being uh, how your father got his middle name. Oh, but, uh, but Jill, yeah, I'll let you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a short introduction. Uh, That's right. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I jumped again. No, don't worry. <laughs> Um, um, for everybody viewing, uh, we're going to introduce uh, the, the Black Cabinet member um, with each question and answer session with each individual descendant. And um, then we're going to have a, a, a little bit of a discussion amongst the descendants and then we'll open it up for your questions too. So we're looking forward to getting your questions. So um, Joseph Roosevelt Houchins, he um, was born in 1900 and he died in 1990. He was a graduate of Cornell University and he had degrees in economics and law both. Um, he was appointed in 1935 to the Commerce Department and he was a specialist in um, business affairs and uh, an assistant to Eugene Kunkel Jones, who was the head of the Urban League and who was appointed to the Black Cabinet was significant because um, he brought in a certain perspective from the Urban League, but he relied heavily on um, Dr. Houchins for uh, data to, to information to go out to the field with. In addition to documenting inequalities, um, Dr. Houchins also showed the importance of black business to uplift and he continued in the US government. He is probably one of the longest serving black cabinet members. He was transferred to the census department and he continued into 1953 when the Eisenhower administration reorganized the government and it cut out a lot of the black voices that had been incorporated as early as the New Deal program. So there. <laughs> so. So I'm looking so forward to, to uh, talking with you, uh, Professor Houchins and um, Kelvin. Over to you. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, we're really interested in, in what you would love to, to share with us, uh, Professor Houchins. But um, uh, uh, you know, one of the questions that we that we have, um, we'd love for you to answer at some point, is how your father got his middle name. Um, I have no idea. My father, my father was an orphan. His, the place that he lived in, in Ithaca, New York, was with a relative, we think. And I know almost nothing about his childhood and found out what I could from the records of Cornell that they keep on dead alumni. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. have incredible, I never mm -hmm. knew my grandfather's name till I looked in their records. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I can't, I assume he was named after Theodore, but other than that, I can't tell you. He is a real um, mystery to me and he wanted to remain that. So I am not looking up his genealogy on anything. He mm -hmm. can stay that mystery he wanted to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, the next question I, I have for you is, you know, generally I'm interested in what your father's experience in government was. Um, I'm also very much interested if you um, have any insight into it, um, uh, uh, how he thought about this work of, uh, of doing uh, policy and strategizing, uh, the frustrations, the pleasures, if there were any. Uh, <laughs> well, there are a couple of things. He certainly didn't talk a lot about the Black Cabinet, and I was born in the last year of the Black Cabinet. But what is really, it seems to me, important is not only that he went all over into census, but after census, he was on the President's Committee for Government Contracts. That committee becomes the Committee for Equal Job Opportunity. Right, So he has a longer history than the Black Cabinet uh, and a longer history than census. Um, I knew he was on the Black Cabinet because of that famous rolled up picture that he would occasionally take out of the drawer. And I knew more about the census. So I thought it was really important 
when Jill began to talk about data because he, I know how much people appealed to him for data for their various policy mm -hmm. programs. Not only they, but he saw himself maybe not as a political person, but as a member of a think tank. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have used mm -hmm. that term, but he enjoyed the interchange with black scholars and scholars used his office. So John Hope Franklin used to tell me about how you used to come down and work in my father's office. And when I began teaching literature, my father said, you wanna see a letter I have from Zora Neale Hurston who carried on uh, a correspondence with him. If we could get those archives, lately I've been getting licensed as an archi archivist, who would we see who've asked him about that material. Mm -hmm. And so the only mm -hmm. publishing work, published work, no, the main published works I know about are those that we republished with Dr. Rodney Green of Howard University. And there were two uh, papers that he produced on black government. But I think we shouldn't be, mis uh, excuse me, on black business. But I think we shouldn't be fooled into thinking that business was his sole interest. Because when he moved to the president's committee, it was about how to use contracts to leverage businesses to hire Blacks and to offer equal opportunities in businesses that had government contracts. That seems to me very, very powerful work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we agree. And you know, we should note I mean, your father uh, uh, served on uh, the agency that was the forerunner to the EEOC. Yes. Um, um, uh, you know, your father had a law degree uh, in addition to being an economist. Um, I'm curious uh, how he thought, uh, if you have any insight into the relationship between data um, and um, uh, 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 law, um, you know, uh, 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 securing uh, uh, civil liberties for African Americans in the courtroom. Well, I think that we know of one case where uh, data is important. We know several cases, but we know that for Brown, that data was important. And I knew that people called my father for data for their civil rights law cases. And he was, he saw himself as the source of information on black people and for the kinds of proof you needed to bring into law. Um, his degree was in labor economics and labor law. And he studied for a while with a man named Royal Montgomery in, um, at Cornell who specialized in labor economics and labor law. And what he wanted to do is use that data to bolster law cases, to uh, form laws, if not only in court, but in the writing of laws. And so when the, they closed the uh, Bureau of Negro Statistics and he was without a job uh, for a while, it was the NAACP, it was the Urban League, it was all of these black activist organizations that clamored to bring him back to government. So there was this, a mm -hmm. real campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Did he come? Did he come back into government after fifty three? Then after? oh yes, yes. Yeah. So he, so he was. Uh, that was when he was on the president's committee. Okay. It was not until after, I guess, until the uh, he retired really mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the. Uh, Kennedy administration, and then he had a whole other career for 20 years. He was at Howard University in the econ department, just as they were beginning their doctoral program. Hmm. Mm. Uh. When he came back into government in 1955, he was appointed by that's Nixon, right. by Nixon, that's, that's right. correct? That's right, uh, which he always found, and I always found funny, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and my politics are a little farther yeah, left yeah. than my father's, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> How did he feel about his service when he reflected on it? Well, there are two things. Clearly things didn't happen as fast as he wanted. There were not the changes at the rate he wanted, but Last Friday, I was looking at C-SPAN, and there was a man by the name of Ken Garrett, who's written a book on the last Negroes at Harvard, and he talked about the feelings that Black people had in 55 and the early 60s. They thought that what work they did was going to hurry change, and so Mr. Garrett, who is alive now, he said, and of course we were wrong and I've had to live through Trump. I say the same to you, Mr. Garrett. And he says, so now we've got to start again. But I think my father thought for a while that the work he did was going to bring about huge changes. And it did bring about changes, but not as quickly or as deep or as profound as he thought would happen. Mm, mm. Before we, we, we move on to our next panelist, uh, Professor uh, Houchins, th this is a great segue. Uh, uh, how, if at all, do you view your own work as a scholar uh, in relation to the unfinished business uh, that your, your, your father uh, started? Um, uh, uh, does, it, does it motivate in any way uh, how you think about your own work? about my own work. I suppose I see, I see myself as a scholar activist, right? And so I think my father, that would be how my father would have defined himself. And now that I am long of tooth, as what Shakespeare would call it, now that I am older, I see myself preparing young people. So I'm writing letters of recommendation for people of color to law schools and for PhD programs. I teach a about the predations of white supremacy. I talk about economics, though I'm a literature teacher, and I talk about the Black Atlantic. My field is primarily diasporic literature, so Africa, the Caribbean, Canada, and England. But I don't know that I'm quite the same, uh, do quite the same kind of work my father did, though he really, really liked finally that I had gotten into literature and that I had gotten into critical theory. Um, thank you for that, Professor Houchins. Um, I'm told that uh, before we move to our next panelist, we're going to show the picture um, of the Black Cabinet group, uh, the photo. So this is this is the photo from the 1937 conference that the Black Cabinet had. This actually, the, um, the, the there are three of the descendants relatives in this. So Edgar Brown is in this photo, um, Henry Hunt, and then Constance Daniel. So. Uh, Actually, um, if you look at the photo, you can see Constance Daniel there um, on to the, I guess it's to the left. And she's just, a, I think the third <laughs> row up and she's facing towards uh, Mrs. Bethune who's there in the center. So, <laughs> so they had a number of um, conferences uh, sponsored to, uh, to discuss the situation of black Americans based on a lot of the data that was being generated by uh, Joseph Houchins. So, <laughs> so this is that, that photo. The, the other photo shows the, the other folks. So, so thank you for that. Um, I, there it is. Okay, so this, okay. This, has, um, this has Mrs. Bethune in the middle and then um, Edgar Brown is on the second row to her left. He's second from the end there. And um, um, Joseph Hutchins is he's second. Is he at the, he's at the end of that same yes. row on the right. That's right. That's right. Is that right? Yes. And then Henry Hunt is two, two over there uh, on the right. Uh, they're they're all standing there in the back row. And this was just a photo that was taken in 1938 out in front of um, one of the office buildings. So I'm not entirely sure which one, but I think. I think it's outside of commerce. Yeah, it looks like it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so great photos. <laughs> okay, I know folks are like, oh, see, you can't just do five minutes, huh? I know, I know, there's, there's so much. So um, 
Next, we're going to talk about Constance C.H. Daniel. So um, Constance C.H. Daniel was born in 1894, and she passed away in 1962. She was an educator, a journalist, and um, I have to mention a member of the National Council of Negro Women. She was a close associate of Mary McLeod Bethune, and um, she was the second woman to join the Black Cabinet. The first woman is Mary McLeod Bethune, and um, she came in. Uh, in 1938, she was hired into the Department of Agriculture and the Farm Security Administration. And she, uh, she actually wore a lot of hats, as they say. She studied farm relief to assess whether it was getting to Black Americans, and her answer was no. And so she was fighting within the Department for Resources and to get the fair share. And then on top of it, the department was using her to write press releases. And so what's really interesting uh, about Constance Daniel is she is not one to hold back. She wrote honestly what was going on. And she um, fights within the department, a, a strong fight. I mean, agriculture is significant. Majority of Black Americans in the 30s in this period of time are in the farming belt. And um, eventually she, she resigns from the department in protest because she's discovered that they're paying the poll taxes, the agriculture department is paying the poll taxes of white farmers, but they are not paying the poll taxes of black farmers and she flags that inequality in that practice. And uh, Donna, I don't know if you know, but I, I discovered, I, I meant to tell you this, that they tried to keep her, they raised her salary to $8,000, which is, is a considerable sum in that period of time. And she refused it because they would not address that practice. So, mm -hmm. so um, I, hopefully that captures her. So. Thank you so much, uh, Donna Marshall, for joining us. So, my pleasure. It's my pleasure. So, so uh, Donna, we are. Uh, uh, we would love to know what you would like for us to know um, about Constance Daniel. Um, uh, you know, her time and <laughs> can. Yes? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Can we have Donna um, read from the manuscript? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Well, first of all, I would not be my, uh, I wouldn't be Constance's granddaughter if I didn't correct Mr. Holzer, who uh, did the introduction. I am writing a book about my grandmother and not my grandfather. So I just needed to make that clear. I don't need any visitations from my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to clear that up. My grandmother wrote a 10 page letter and it's called a statue for Mary Bethune. And she felt that there should be one. And I'm just gonna just read a little bit from those 10 pages, not all 10. It says a statue for Mary Bethune. There were the early conferences on Negro affairs which brought together an impressive representation of Negro leadership from all parts of the country. Few who were bitten, regardless of party affiliation, cared to miss the opportunity, seeing at first hand what was going on in Washington or of proposing ways and means of making the new programs vehicles for meeting special needs and speeding up progress towards full citizenship for the disadvantaged Negro minority. Over these conferences, Mary Bethune presided in matriarchal splendor, holding the reins over an array of leadership that a lesser personality could never have managed. Those who saw it will not soon forget the spectacle of presiding officer Bethune quietly moving around the table to the side of a two vocal gentleman who had ignored her gavel. Taking him by the hand without a word, she led the protesting recalcitrant through the door at the rear, closed it firmly behind him and returned unruffled to her duties. That bit of showmanship brought down the house. It also established the, the Bethune control, which was not again challenged. One solid Bethune accomplishment of the Roosevelt years was the gathering together for counsel and pooling of informational resources of middle and upper bracket Negro government personnel, holding policy influencing positions in key agencies. Most of them 
were competent, trained workers, informed, informable, and extensive contacts in many fields of action in all parts of the country, some with and some without political ties. This loosely knit group came to be known as the Black Cabinet, met for several years at more or less regular intervals, often requested from their agencies the backdrop of Thune's appearances in far distant places. But this solid core of Bethune cooperators gathered on inspiration or command at her small apartment in Northwest Washington for neither time or inclination for detail. Her forte was to surround herself with ideal people who could plan and produce what was needed. In this flexible circle of supporters, some who were personally devoted and some concerned only with results which ideas voiced through her might achieve, but all recognized the tremendous capacity for torch bearing and the best minds in the country sought her out, responded and helped, which made her a force to be reckoned with. That was my grandma. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that answers the question in part, what would you have us know? About, about your about your grandmother there's a lot there's a lot there I'm I'm curious what what do you what are some things that um, you feel uh, 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 capture her experience in the black cabinet but I'm also curious about her motivation to say more about why she wanted to go there we know that she was disappointed and um, um, uh, and stood up for her beliefs um, and when the time came, um, uh, left the black cabinet. I'm curious about how that same moral conviction got her into the black cabinet to begin with. I can, I can only speak on what my mom shared. I'm getting to know my grandmother through her writing. My grandmother, my grandmother uh, was a columnist, uh, an educator, and the more I read about her, the more I wish I was named Constance. I believe I'm a lot like her as well as my sisters and my brothers. Um, my grandmother was a very educated woman. She graduated from high school at 14. She went to college and graduated at 19. She became a professor of English at Tuskegee at the age of 20. So she was no joke. She was no joke. One of the things that she was sure of was who she, who she was. She knew that she was educated. She knew she was articulate, but she had a heart to serve. And that is in all of us in my family. My grandmother wanting to be a part of the Black Cabinet, I think, I want to think that Miss Bethune said Constance because no one called her Connie. But I think she said, this is something that you need to be a part of. Or, or that invitation um, to this elite group. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was a jack of all trades and she assisted Miss Bethune in any and every way she could. I believe that um, my grandmother was big on education. And before she got involved in the Black Cabinet, my grandmother and grandfather ran the first all Black high school in St. Mary's County. And they endured a lot of hardship. Um, everything was against them, even though they were told differently. And so I believe that my grandmother just wanted to help her people. My grandmother and grandfather, there was a big difference between them. My grandfather came from the Virgin Islands where his father had slaves. My grandmother came from St. Paul, Minnesota where her family were slaves. So I, I have to believe that there was pure love there but education brought them together because they both taught with her parents at Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question. 
Yes, you did. You yes, you did. I, and I don't want to hog the, all the all the time, so I'll let Jill jump in. You know, um, I I, I want to focus on your grandmother because um, Miss Mrs. Bethune is such a towering figure, right? And yeah. But Donna, I have to say, uh, she was Mrs. Bethune. Miss, she was the. She was, I, I don't know how to say it. She was the voice of Mrs. Bethune, right? She, she was her right-hand person, yes. Right, right. She would, but she was ghostwriting for Mrs. Bethune, especially yes. at the end of her life, right? Am I right? Yes, in the latter years, she wrote the column for Miss Bethune uh, in the Chicago Tribune. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are many, many, you know, my niece uh, sent me to the Library of Congress and my husband and I, we trudged there and we went and looked for some of the articles and we found many articles um, that she wrote. So mm -hmm. yes. And then you blessed me with 130 letters between Miss Bethune and my grandmother. And I really enjoyed reading them because she just did not bite her tongue. She mm -hmm. felt that some people were using Miss Bethune uh, for their own gain. And um, she was going to do whatever she had to do to assist Miss Bethune up until the day she passed away. Mm. We were talking, Kelvin and I were talking about this um, earlier. We were talking about she was the one person I think who really could tell Miss Bethune off, actually, and and she could be very forthright with her and um, and redirect redirect Mrs. Bethune. I think I think a lot of the men would attempt to do that. And I think that for both her and uh, Mrs. Bethune, being the only women, especially in the earlier period, there are more women in the Black Cabinet later, but they're the two primary female movers of the Black Cabinet. And I think it was really important that she was able to redirect Mrs. Bethune. And I think Mrs. Bethune listened to her when the men were constantly trying to give her feedback and tell her what to do. So, so I think that's significant. Donna, can you, um, can you, uh, can you just talk a little bit about, you knew her, so what was she like? Just give us an okay. overview. So I was very young. You know, I was talking with my cousin, uh, Deborah, and I was saying, do you remember grandma doing this? Or do you remember grandma doing that? She went, no. <laughs> and my, my memories of my grandmother was one, she never smiled. I mm -hmm. never saw her smile. But I remember going in her home and to the right, there were double doors. And to the right of those doors was a little alcove. And I said, she must have done some of her greatest writing there. And then my cousin said, no, that's where the telephone was. So um, my grandmother was stern. Uh, she was matter of fact. And again, I was young. I, I was seven or eight you know, going to her home. I stayed at her home a lot. And I just wish that, um, I wish that she had lived a lot longer so I could have those conversations with her. But one of the things I thank God for is my mother. My mother kept all of her mother's papers, everything she could find. So I have um, the carbon copies of the many things she wrote about you know, and I'm learning so much about her through that and through conversations with my dad, you know, Constance's son-in-law, Ellsworth Hutchinson is still alive and kicking. And so he would share some things um, with us. And as I, as I think back on some of the things my mom used to say and tell us about her mother, I truly understand now why it was so important um, for people to share their family history. You may not have that relative that was on television or you know, in the newspapers, but as I'm doing the research, grandma was in the newspapers a lot other than having her own column, you know, with Capitol Close Up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working, um, writing for the Afro. And then one of the things I loved about her was in a lot of the things that she wrote when she tried to get some of her work published, she, I have so many rejection letters from Harper's Bazaar and Reader's Digest and different things, different, different magazines. And she said, okay, well, you're not gonna publish my work as Constance Daniel. Maybe you'll 
go ahead and publish my work. And she had a couple of men's names she would write under. So I love that about her. She was not going to let anyone stop her, especially from getting her point across. So great. So great. Wonderful. I think we should probably move on to right. our next panel. Thank you so much for that. Ms. Yeah, Marshall. my Thank pleasure. You. So um, the next person we're going to talk about is Edgar G. Brown, born in 1898, uh, passed away in 1954. He was uh, a Republican Party uh, stalwart and a very uh, active in the party. He was a journalist and a tennis champion and um, had worked for Madam C.J. Walker before he came into government. Um, his ties to government are interesting and I'd like to hear a little more about his relationship with Erwin McDuffie, who was FDR's valet. Uh, he uh, first joined the government in 1934 uh, in, in the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. And then he was transferred to the Civilian Conservation Corps and he remained there in 19, until 1942 when Congress closed the Civilian Conservation Corps to redirect funds to the war. This happened to a lot of black cabinet members as the New Deal was uh, struck down by Congress and the money redirected. Uh, he fought tenaciously within the Civilian Conservation Corps with the leadership um, which was mostly military and extremely hostile. Um, he fought to expand the Civilian Conservation Corps and integrate it. And he succeeded in that to a great degree. And he succeeded in getting jobs and training for black youth, educational resources. And also he succeeded in getting better pay for uh, DC uh, staff members like the custodians. So he was, he was a, a pretty remarkable guy as well. So um, I'm really happy that we could talk with uh, Judge Brown today uh, uh, about his his ancestor. So, uh, Judge Brown, uh, I I have a question um, right off the bat. You, your father uh, is such a charismatic character, uh, um, uh, as I've gotten to know him in reading Jill's work. Um, he was different. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love for you to be able to speak to that. One of the things that 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 stood out to me in this history of um, these um, uh, highly gifted um, uh, African Americans uh, uh, that felt the call of public service and were trying to do something um, um, uh, to, to to move the needle uh, in the national conversation um, and uh, structurally in terms of policy uh, that in entering into government they each to varying um, uh, degrees experienced um, uh, dismay or dejection with the, the culture of Washington politics um, uh, and question uh, uh, the, the value and utility of continuing on their, their work in various, various points in time. One of the things that Jill says about your father uh, in the book is that he seemed to enter into the black cabinet uh, with uh, an ability to get things done. That he had some kind of sensibility uh, that gave him uh, some way of seeing things and working dynamics. Um, so as he was perhaps learning Washington politics, he brought with him some kind of uh, uh, understanding of maybe political power. Do, do you have a sense of how he gained that, how he acquired that, how he came to government with that sensibility? Yeah, John Lewis said that you should cause trouble, good trouble. <laughs> yeah. And that's all I can remember about him. Uh, he was uh, a visionary. He was uh, my mentor. Uh, he didn't stay in his lane at the CCC. Uh, he thought that once he got into the door, he didn't believe in pulling the ladder up after him. Uh, we got to expand. And even though he did a lot in the CCC, he actually uh, got involved with the Department of War, which then was, now we call it the Department of Defense. He got involved in the Department of the Interior and involved in the Department of Agriculture. He wanted to make sure that uh, they were uh, stepping up to the plate. Uh, he was all about equal rights 
in every aspect of life. Even in the black cabinet, he organized the National uh, United, United Employees Union. And he organized all the blacks who were mainly in the lower echelons, uh, janitors and charwomen, they called them. They never had a pay raise from the day they got there. He got them their first and I think their uh, subsequent pay raises and put them on a, on a track to earn more money. Um, uh, you said he was he was a champion, a uh, tennis player, the national champion, uh, four year times. He would have been every year, but they kicked him out of the of the tour because he was complaining about the fact that they didn't play tennis to, to win. The way to play the tennis to win was like Bill Tilden played the way he played. So he won every time they finally let him back in and he came back and won the championship two more times. And he worked with Madam Walker and convinced her that she should advertise because she used to go to people's houses and fix up their hair. And he got her first contract with Rexall Drugstore. Uh, then he uh, did everything he could in the department. And But Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a real, real uh, libertarian and civil rights person, uh, we know what she did at Tuskegee, uh, which was part of my father's plan to have trained black pilots for uh, the uh, Air Corps. And there's an article in uh, the Washington Post uh, Thai, uh, magazine, uh, February the 10th, 2003, about uh, how people flew from Chicago to Washington tried to uh, explain that, that blacks could fly. Because white people didn't want black people flying over them. They thought they might <laughs> drop a bomb on them. Uh, but uh, then he uh, left politics. Uh, the the um, I'm speeding up. I I know you run out of time. He left uh, the car uh, the, and uh, went into politics. And he started the National Negro Council. And he started that because uh, he tried to get an Andy Lynch law, which we still don't have, a civil rights law, a fair employment law, an anti poll tax law, and many laws which uh, took a while to get. Uh, because Eleanor Roosevelt told him that Franklin wasn't going to do anything. And if he wanted to get something done for the race and for black people in particular, he had to go out and start his own organization. And that's when he left in the early uh, 40s and started the National Negro Council, uh, which organized uh, mainly petitions. He wasn't a lawyer and he thought Hasty and people like Thurgood Marshall came later. The law was good, but he thought public agitation was the way. And he was a petitioner and street corner advocate and uh, riled people up. As a matter of fact, he, he got petitions signed to get Bilbo expelled from the Senate. Uh, and he got beaten up. Uh, there was, that was another beat up on the steps of the Capitol. He got beaten up and had to go to the hospital because he was pre presenting petitions to get rid of Bilbo. And there's an article in Time Magazine uh, about that in uh, Time Magazine, uh, December 30th, 1946. Um, but other than that, he just uh, did everything he could to make sure that uh, black people got the same rights and privileges that everyone else. And that's what he was all about. Totally dedicated, as far as I know, all his life. Uh, he got, he was, they tried to kick him out of the, the government many times. Uh, Roosevelt intervened and saved his job many, many times because of his relationship with Mr. McDuffie, who was Roosevelt's valet. So every time he got fired in the uh, raising hell, <laughs> Mr. McDuffie went to the president, Roosevelt, and said, give him another chance. So eventually he uh, ran out of chances. <laughs> but that's about it as far as I can uh, remember about him, as I said. Uh, he got me involved early on, and I have an article here from Newsweek, 1949, January 10th, he and I are sitting uh, in a restaurant, uh, a sit, uh, sit in, because uh, the airport in uh, Washington, National Airport, named after Reagan, who was no friend of black people, um, is in Maryland or Virginia, one of the two, which was segregated. So he, we were in 1949 sitting in those places, those restaurants, uh, trying to integrate them. But uh, we don't. Nobody knows about that. Fortunately, news people would newspeak uh, knows about it. And then, of course, the Charlotte uh, uh, people came later in North Carolina. So 
yeah, he was doing everything he could to, uh, uh, as he said, my, my life is to drive white men crazy. Wait, women too, I guess. But that was it. Blacks were in bad shape, really bad shape. And they were paid less. And uh, it, was, it was hard. And uh, the Black Cabinet is really an important thing to read. And all the people who are on today should definitely get their papers sent down, as I said earlier, to the Amistad uh, in Tul at Tulane Research Center, because this is stuff that needs to be preserved. All these young people have no idea what the struggle is. As I said, my kids and my grandkids, they, they work for Facebook and uh, hedge funds, and they, they think life was like that all the time. And uh, my father told me if I ever made $10,000 a year, I'd be rich. <laughs> uh, so they got to know that the black cabinet paid 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 the heavy heavy dues for these people and took a lot of abuse uh, and uh, it's still a long struggle and Trump set us back but we're gonna have to turn around but uh, I think Barack said it too is it's baby steps mm -hmm. so we want progress but uh, we got a long way to go a very long way what I did finally I'll just end up with I tried to mentor as many young black people as I could. So in the 39 years I was on the bench, I had well over 30 law clerks, minority, people of color, and they'd done pretty well. My, my, my highest uh, achievement is the, I had one of my law clerks on the Connecticut Supreme Court. So I, I, I tried to contribute. I mean, I, I, I think I owe, owe, owe people and I, I think I owe my father. So I'm still struggling. And my last thing was, uh, to sponsor a bill in the Massachusetts legislature, legislature called the Freddie Gray Act, so that police will take medical considerations in consideration when they arrest uh, mainly black people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think mm -hmm. I've used up my five minutes, and I want everybody else to have okay. a shot. <laughs> okay, I want to. Can you talk about FDR a little more? You you told uh, the me story. About uh, sorry, I told you the other day when. When the black leaders, Miss Bethune and all of them, came in to see FDR, and this is what Mr. 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 McDuffie said, he had sit there, he'd nod, it uh, approvingly, and and say it was really interesting. He appreciated the fact that they brought these matters to his attention, and uh, he would uh, give it full consideration. And as soon as they leave, Mr. McDuffie would say, "Well, what are you gonna do, Mr. President?" He said, "Not a goddamn thing." And that was Franklin's approach to African-American affairs. That's why Eleanor told my father that if he wanted to get something done, he had to leave. Because Franklin was in bed with all the Southern Democrats who people don't know up until 48 uh, were bigots, Bilbo, Rankin, and those people. And then the Dixiecrats came in in 48. And that's why my father went Republican. Because if you read about how Bilbo got kicked out of the Senate, it was Republicans who did it. Now the Republicans have gone crazy and the Democrats have come back. So it's very complicated. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's, a, that's another uh, Roosevelt mm -hmm. House story. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you met FDR though, is that correct? Yes, I met, I met him. I, well, I was very young. I mean, uh, it was in the 30s. So I can't remember when it was. I was either seven or eight. As I told you once, uh, he was in his bed because as you know, he couldn't walk and uh, he was smoking his cigarette in his long cigarette holder. And, uh, and, he, and Mr. McDuffie used to be right there and he had a little bell. So he'd run up and take care of him. And Mrs. McDuffie worked in the White House. She was uh, Eleanor's uh, upstairs uh, maid or whatever they call her. And she wrote a book, which is called, uh, I Work for FDR, Lizzie McDuffie, which uh, was also quite interesting. She was a wonderful woman too. Uh, but Mr. McDuffie finally, uh, you know, he, the pressure uh, was just too much for him and he finally failed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, no, F FDR was like uh, the mayor of uh, New York. I can't think of his name, Jimmy Walker or something mm -hmm. of that nature. And they used to ask him, what have you done for black people? And he'd say nothing. But then he'd talk about uh, civil service and unemployment and welfare and said, you know, the tide raises all boats, but that's just not true. You got to have a boat. <laughs> and black people had no boat, so they didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it was not easy. And uh, I just, final story was I went to Harvard only because my father said Roosevelt went there 
And that's the only way we'll ever make it. Well, after I finished with honors at Harvard, I got no job. So that didn't do me any good either. So my military career, that was the only career I got when I finished it with my honors degree from Harvard. 10 years later, I got out because I figured I'd, I'd stall around enough. I had to get back into the battle and I got out and went to law school. And since then I've, I've been in trouble. <laughs> good trouble. Good right. trouble. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much. Um, oh, so now I have the honor and great much much gratitude to uh, Wanda Hunt McLean, Ms. McLean. I'm so so glad to have you here, and I appreciate your. So I have the honor to introduce uh, Henry A. Hunt, 1866 to 1838, an educator, uh, principal at the Fort Valley S School. Um, an agricultural specialist, and he was nationally recognized for his expertise in farming. He joined the Black Cabinet in November of 1933 as one of the first members. He had been recommended for the position by W.E.B. Du Bois, and he was a, a member of the Farm Credit Bureau, which is an independent but affiliated agency with Treasury and the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, he, his, his focus was agriculture and he was significant in, um, we were talking about this, Wanda and I, about the establishment of the River Farms Cooperative in, there in Georgia. So um, successful, incredibly successful model for farm relief for African-American farmers in the New Deal. And um, so thanks for the honor of being able to introduce your, your uh, relative, Wanda, appreciate it. and. Uh, I should note that Henry Hunt died uh, suddenly in 1938 while he was serving still, so. Yeah, he was, he was actually in Washington at the time, but let, let me say first, it is very difficult to be last because I have three, three uh, uh, great people before me. So I have, yeah, it's hard to, you know, come last <laughs> before no, the three not. people who came before me because I, you know, I, I did not know my great grandfather because he passed away long before I was born. And of course his wife died uh, when I was about two years old. Uh, if not for my mother, I would not know much of nothing about my great grandfather. She did not know him either, but uh, she, she is an artist and an art historian. So she kind of got me going uh, on history. So just about everything I know about my great grandfather is uh, talking to relatives before they passed away and then doing a lot of genealogy. And so uh, that's basically what I do know about him. So you asked the questions. <laughs> Did yeah. you know he was in the black cabinet? Uh, Cynthia, your cousin. Yeah. Easily, she said she didn't even. Know. Yeah, yeah I, I'm the one that told Cynthia because my mother gave me a picture <laughs> of him, the the one that that I think is on the front of your book. My mother gave me that picture when I was about ten years old, and I I mean you know I had no idea what the black cabinet was, and then later in life I kept hearing about the black cabinet today, you know with John Conyers and whatnot. And, um, and, and that's all I knew. And there was actually, uh, here comes one of the cats. There was actually uh, no information about this black cabinet. And then, you know, years later, I just thought about mentioning it to Cynthia. And she didn't know anything about it. And, I, you know, she actually went to the archives on campus at Fort Valley State. And they have a rather large archives, but I don't know if there's that much information there about the Black Cabinet. I don't know if she had that much time or what. So she got in touch with the Library of Congress and they knew absolutely nothing about it. And uh, she said, well, let's, let's bring up this flag that FDR gave the family well, my great grandfather passed away when he was in Washington. And it, it was, you know, we don't know where this rumor came from, but they started writing newspaper articles because we had found newspaper articles saying that the flag actually draped 
the casket of Abraham Lincoln. And we know that there's a lot of mystery behind Abraham Lincoln's body disappearing for a few years. And then when they finally got it, they put his body under cement. So we made contact with the Smithsonian and the experts there said that we have no record of a flag draping his casket. So we don't know where this flag, we don't know where the flag came from other than maybe somewhere in the attic of the White House, because at the time, maybe they were not keeping inventory. I know because of Jacqueline Kennedy, I think she was the one that started keeping inventory of furniture in the White House. So people would not just walk away with it, you know, bringing in, you know, things and exchanging it every now and then. Uh, so this flag is under preservation because people have tried to use it for display for various reasons. So all I know is that uh, my great grandfather, he grew up farming mm -hmm. and he was also a carpenter. So farming was his trade and being a carpenter was his trade. And he was very interested in seeing to it that, well, well, he knew that former slaves were highly skilled in many areas and farming was one of them. And this 40 acres and a mule was not gonna work. And he wanted uh, former slaves who tilled land to actually own land and actually have a house on that land and do their own farming. And then you mentioned to me the, uh, the Flint river project and that must have been very frustrating for him because after looking into that in george i guess it was macon county or houston county you know they've changed the counties around because fort valley is actually in peach county where i was born and when he was in washington doing the fdr a new deal after he passed away that program went into fruition you know, the Flint River Farming Project. But then after World War II, when all of the soldiers came home, all of that land was given to white soldiers. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, the project just went bottoms up. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this happened across the country because they, you know, I think in a lot of, all of the Southern states, they had this, program under the new deal because not too far from here yeah, yeah. they have it uh up here with the farmers and whatnot but of course i think all of those programs fall you know fell apart but uh that was one thing that he was really interested in not just education but seeing to it that the farmers were educated could i ask you just yeah could i ask you a, a, Go ahead. a, a question about that um miss hunt mclean you know, the, your great grandfather, he, as you know, uh, went to Denmark to study uh, cooperative farming there. Um, and there are these great moments in Jill's book where uh, uh, your great grandfather's uh, voice, Henry Hunt's voice um, is presented to us, his thoughts on farming, property ownership for black folks, agrarian land reform, um, the importance of having credit unions um, uh, as a kind of source of uh, kind of capital and, you know, uh, lending institutions for black folks. He had this whole uh, 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 kind of systematic approach to how um, uh, black folks in the rural South uh, could enter into uh, the economy. Uh, do you have any um, uh, kind of sense what, what took him to Denmark and kind of, you know, what what inspired uh, uh, this kind of kind of fulsome sense of 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 what a a kind of good life um, and an equitable life for 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 black people would look like? Well, he, apparently he knew about it. He probably studied it, so he probably wanted to go over there and look at it firsthand. Yeah. And I think that I I think that he because he grew up with a white father who took care of, of him and his eight brothers and sisters. This man was not married to anyone. 
and he educated him and all of his brothers and sisters. And I think he knew the importance of land and ownership because when he went into this, this Flint River project, that's when he found out the importance of land because white men in the area gave him a hard time. They had no use for the land. They did not want the land, but they would not give it up. And they fought him and they, they went through hoops of fire to prevent him from getting this land. And I think, he, that's, I think that's when he really learned that land is one of the most valuable things in the world. And I think during Reconstruction, when they were talking about giving former slaves land, that was probably one of the biggest arguments they give our land away. Because it was just, I mean, even today, you know, you just, you just don't give anyone's land away because that's probably, I mean, you know, you can give, anyone can go to, uh, anyone can buy a Rolls Royce. If you have enough money to put down on a Rolls Royce, you can buy a Rolls Royce. I guarantee you, you can go, you can go and buy um, a Rolls Royce today. You might not be able to take care of the upkeep, but they will let you buy a Rolls Royce because when you drive it out of the lot, the value is going to hit the floor. But if you talk about buying some land, you're in trouble. They're going to give you a hard time about buying land. And, and this is something I think that he realized early when he was a child because his father worked him and his brothers very hard on the farm. Not to be cruel, but he understand land early and probably somewhere along the line, he learned or someone probably told him about what was going on in Denmark. I've been to Denmark before and I went to Denmark. It was about three feet of snow. I didn't see any farms. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, it's beautiful, but you know, so apparently, you know, they were over there at a different time. But I think this is probably from his, his upbringing. Mm -hmm. He definitely knew the importance of, of farming and he combined it with, with academics. And he was very concerned because, you know, people look at Alabama and Mississippi as being the glad places in the deep south. Well, see, my people go back to the 1700s in Georgia. Georgia's bad. <laughs> Georgia was really bad. And he knew how bad Georgia was because his people were from Georgia. And uh, I was telling Jill that his wife, Florence, was also active. Both of them were active in education because there was a time if uh, if young black girls got pregnant and they would not marry, they were actually in prison. So she set up a program where they could actually live in a home like a dormitory and actually take classes so they would not go to prison. And I mean, I'm just sitting up here thinking, how can you put someone in prison for being pregnant because you're not married? But this, this is, you know, this is some of the stuff that they did. And so he realized the importance of education and he also realized the importance of uh, farming. But Jill and I were kind of surprised when we saw that he did not get credit for this, this uh, Flint River thing. But I think it's because the Flint River fell under the new deal. And I guess that's because Roosevelt was going to get credit for that. You know, just completely get credit for the New Deal, as far as I know. But I do know that he was close to uh, Dr. Bethune, Mary McLeod Bethune, because the picture you just showed is the one where his, uh, there's a picture of my great-grandfather on the wall. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that she and my great grandfather often talked about their sons. My great grandfather had one son, and Dr. Mathum had one son, Albert. They were both in mortuary science. And I think they were a little on the wild side, maybe a little spoiled. <laughs> Her son went to his school. My great my grandfather went to uh, my, my great granddaddy's school. And I think I know my 
my granddaddy ended up going to a couple of schools throughout the South because he knew a lot of people. And it, it, I guess because both of his parents were working so hard, I don't know. You know, you can't blame yourself for what your kids do. But uh, they were close in the sense that they used to compare notes about the children, what their children were doing and what their children were not doing. So they were not just colleagues, but they were. Uh, they were friends and they used to compare notes about raising children. And so, um, but I don't know too, too much about the, um, you know, what was going on so far as, as his work. I do know that when I was growing up in Georgia, I thought it was royalty. And I know that sounds bad because as soon as people found out that I was a hunt, uh, first thing out of their mouth, are you related to so-and-so? Right. And it, 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 <laughs> it was just a different world. And I really did not know what was going on. I imagine, you know, I imagine yeah. that all of the panelists had that experience to some extent. Um, yeah. uh, we need to, I'm sorry, thank you so much, um, uh, Ms. Hunt, um, McLean. We need to move on to the q and I'm being told. Um, and so um, uh, would you uh, assist us with that? Yes, hello. Yeah. hello everybody. This has been wonderful. Um, there are some great questions coming in from the audience and I can share a few of those with you now. I'm actually gonna try to <clears throat> distill them into three or so uh, in, in the interest of time. Um, but first a, um, a point from Roosevelt House Director Harold Holzer. Um, he says he wants you to know, uh, Wanda, that many yes. flags were draped over Lincoln's coffin as it traveled from city to city between the funeral in Washington, D.C. and his burial site in Springfield. And so uh, okay. it's entirely possible that FDR could have had one of those and that it was given to your family. Um, and he adds as a, as a PS, Lincoln's body was taken from his grave in November 1876, but the, the remains were not disappeared. They were recovered the same night and indeed buried later under cement. Um, oh, okay, well, that's, we probably need to talk to that person. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. we'll get in touch with you later because we were definitely told that that flag, uh, so, but the flag is in perfect condition, you know, and it's in the archives and it's being preserved and whatnot. And so, and they that's promised great. us that it would stay there. That's great. So here's a question that, um, any and all panelists, uh, if they like, can address. Uh, a question from Charlie Isaacs. In, he wants to know in what specific ways did the advisors of the Black Cabinet take up the cause of the millions of African Americans who were shut out of the participation in, in New Deal programs and to what effect? So for anybody who likes to take that on, please feel free. Well, short answer was every day my father went to work he was uh, complaining about one aspect or another of how blacks were being treated in the government and out of the government and what the government was not doing to alleviate the situation. Uh, and I assume the rest of them were doing it the same thing. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, difficult. <laughs> they, as I said, the guy that ran the CCC, he spent as much time trying to fire my father as he did doing... Uh, what was uh, the right thing to do. So I'm sure they were all doing their best. And it was not easy. No, no. Anybody else care to jump in? Okay. That's all right then. Um, let's go to another general question that everybody should feel free to uh, address. Um, let's see. What do you think that your, um, sorry, how do you feel the black cabinet and your relative impacted the direction of the country? Um, what changes would they be most proud of or most disappointed in? Hmm. <laughs> that's from Robert Keston. <coughs> I think there's a lot to be proud of, but I, I just fear that you know, the last four years, 
the administration has proven to us that things can just crash and burn so rapidly. And uh, hopefully we can avoid something like that happening again, but you just never know. Um, I mean, I love this country and everything, but and it, you know, it's, it's, it's not just black people, it's, it's a lot of people who fear that the country was in a lot of trouble. And, you know, hopefully nothing like that will happen again. But when things like that happen, you just feel like a lot of good things that happened just went to ruin. And, you know, you just don't know what to think that there's so much could happen in such a short time. You know, it's just like it takes uh, a few weeks to gain a lot of weight, but it, it takes forever to lose it. <laughs> and, and it's the same thing when a country falls apart and then, you know, it takes, it takes a lot to get it straight again. So hopefully this will never happen again. But you know what? One of the things that I, th I think if my grandmother was here today, I think she would be somewhat disappointed. You know, as soon as they presented that question, I thought of a song that says, you've got me going in circles. You know, mm -hmm. some of the things yeah. that we are fighting for today, they fought for a hundred years ago. It's like you take yeah. three steps forward and two steps backward. Mm -hmm. You know, why are we yeah. still fighting for the same things over and over and over again? When will anybody get it? You know, so the, so. The, the philosopher king, Doc Rivers, said, we love this country, but the country doesn't love us back. Amen. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I think that my father would have perhaps been proud of the effort he put in for change. But I tell you, if he lived today, it would feel as though it was all for naught. Yes. It really would. Yeah. Uh, well, let's don't go back. You know, people talk about being with Trump was one of the worst times in history. But John Mitchell <laughs> says slavery was worse. So <laughs> I, I, I love John Mitchell. No, no disrespect to Professor Watts. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's say, you, uh, you're in that same class with the Black Cabinet. Um, you know, uh, you know, if I could just uh, amplify the comments that have been made, one of the things that we uh, wanted to get to, didn't have a chance to get to, that I'll insert right now, Jill and I uh, wanted uh, to, to read out four of the policy areas uh, that your Black cabinet relatives outlined in the first of their blue books. Uh, the first was unemployment and lack of economic security for African Americans, inadequate educational and recreational facilities, Third, poor health and housing conditions. Fourth, fear of mob violence and lack of protection under the law. And what's great about these blue books and your black cabinet relatives is that they didn't just enumerate these things. They actually had uh, uh, approaches to, to how you could address these things. Um, um, and so, um, you know, um, uh, I wonder if they would be disappointed um, that uh, not that we haven't recognized that these things are still issues, but that there uh, are approaches um, to, to dealing with them. Here's um, a, a final general question for everyone. Uh, answer if they'd like. From Kimberly Conteras, what words of advice do you believe your ancestor would give to a person of color trying to make a change in this world today for the better in spite of the climate that exists? That's an easy question. Hmm. You gotta vote. You know, the reason why Hillary lost is the black people didn't vote. I said from day one, Philadelphia, Milwaukee and Detroit. Those three cities control the, the, the whole pop, uh, uh, the whole election process. If the black people come out in those three cities, those three states, you flip them, you flip those three states and you have the new president of the United States. It's very simple. Vote, 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 vote. I think my grandmother would have said education. You know, my sister says education is the new currency. And 
before we can vote for somebody, um, this is just in my humble opinion, um, not only do we need to know who they are and what they stand for, but if you're not educated, you, you, you know, I'm about to talk to a bunch of first, and, uh, first through fifth graders about the same uh, topic. And you most definitely have to have education under your belt. Um, you have to have that mutual respect for one another. You have to know who you are. Um, you know, a very wise young lady told me that, you know, my grandmother gave us the courage and the permission uh, to keep trudging and to keep moving forward. And I just think education is the key to everything. Because when you don't know who you are, you don't know where you're going, you don't know where you came from, you can't impart that to the next generation. Just my opinion. No, I, I agree with you. My father came to the Black cabinet from a position at a historically Black college. And when he finally oh, yeah. left government, he went back to teaching. And I think he was most fulfilled okay. as an educator. Okay, go back to that <laughs> That's great. Anybody else? Want to address this? Well, question? Not spawn. Where is she? Um, <laughs> and I, I, I hear some. Well, all those answers, there. all those answers are correct. Yeah. But until you have the power, you can't change the thing. You got to vote. Have the right people in there. Otherwise, it's going to be the same. You got to have the power. You know, go back to Ferguson. Ferguson changed. You know why? because they got black people on the school committee now. They got black people on the police force. If you don't vote, you're not gonna get anything. The power is in the vote. I mean, I know education is good. Jobs are good, it's all good, but you gotta vote. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am now if, if uh, I wasn't appointed and I was appointed by Michael Dukakis, who he, did, he, he ran a lousy campaign for president, but he was a damn good governor. <laughs> <laughs> Education and voting go hand in hand. So um, we're we're about out of time. Um, just just a moment here for any final thoughts from any panelists or either of our moderators. I just hope all this is memorialized because it, it takes people like Professor Watts to go back and do the research because otherwise people won't know about this. I mean, people still think that Jackie Robinson entered a uh, 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 started the whole trend in baseball, but they were great black players way before Jackie Robinson and yeah, much yeah. better. Martin Luther King was not the first person ever to say this. And uh, just like Malcolm X, he did his thing too. Everybody's got to put their oar in the water and they got to work at it because there's a lot going on. As I said, my father's idea was he's got to fight injustice in every aspect of life. And you're right, education, yeah. housing, yeah. everything. But there's still no anti Lynch law. Do you remember? You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah right. So, so the police yeah, been lynching black yeah. people since, since they started trying to get the anti Lynch law passed back in the 1930s. That's almost 100 years ago. Thank you, I hate to be so I hate to be this way, but as I said, my uh, father was one angry man, and I'm still angry. Thank you, Judge. Um, Jill, Calvin, any final words before we wrap up? Um, uh, I'll give Jill the last word. I'll just say that um, <laughs> I, 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 um, he's a good politician. He passed yeah. the buck, right? The <laughs> I, ball is I, in your court. I, I will I will just say uh, yeah. uh, this conversation gave me a yeah. very similar feeling to the one that I had when I read Jill's yeah. book, um, that it was uh, uh, both a celebration of, uh, of, of, of stories of lies of work uh, uh, that Black folks in this country uh, have done in government uh, to make good public policy, whether or not it was followed. Um, but the other thing is um, uh, uh, this sense of motivation uh, to amplify what the judge said and what uh, our other panelists have said. Um, there are things that we can be doing right now and that these figures um, are to be celebrated for what they show us uh, is possible. 
um, uh, uh, ways of organizing, thinking, strategizing, um, and blueprints uh, in some instances for things that we could do uh, and think about today, ways that we can use data um, to help us think through problems, uh, so forth and so on, education and the power of it. So, um, I'm grateful um, uh, 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 for this source of motivation that I can go back to when I need it. Um, so um, my thanks to all of your, your relatives. Thank you, Calvin, Jill. Um, same here, nothing but total gratitude to, um, to you all, especially such an honor to be a part of the panel and to be able to, it's so important to bring this information to the public so that people don't forget. They can't forget this. It's, it, the, the Black cabinet members are such an incredibly, um, they haven't been acknowledged. They're a bridge between the earlier civil rights movement of the 20th century and then the one that we all talk about, but that's a long civil rights movement in this case and that movement needs to continue. And um, just like I said, it's such an honor not only to have spent the time working on your family members, there's a lot more stories to be told, um, but such an honor to know all of you as well and to, to receive your guidance and wisdom. And I so appreciate that. Um, it's interesting because the last time when we talked, Kelvin gave me the last word and we were coming into the election period of time. And I guess, of course, as an educator, I'm gonna say education is so important, right? As, as most of you all have been educators too, but um, the vote, now, now's the time to preserve it, right? Now's the time to make sure that we have it. And th that's the final word we can't, we, I, I agree, I agree. The vote is, is critical. So preserving that right is just instrumental to continuing the work that the Black Cabinet started and the, the continue. And so, so thank you so much, so grateful. Well, thank you for your book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, hope okay. you I hope we can all stay in conversation. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, Donna, Frederick, Wanda, Sue, we are honored and privileged to have hosted you this evening. And thank you, Jill and Kelvin, for leading this uh, special conversation. This was, this was a really special one for us at Roosevelt House. Uh, thanks again for all, all, to all of you for being part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Eleanor. For having me. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you to the viewers. He was a wonderful person. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.